and welcome everyone. I'm Heather Ciccarelli. I am the Director of Patient Navigation Initiative here at the American Cancer Society. I use she, her pronouns. The Patient Navigation Initiative is one element of the American Cancer Society's overall strategic investment in patient navigation and provides opportunities for participants to develop competencies and skills to advance high quality cancer care through an innovative and sustainable models of oncology patient navigation, all the while increasing health disparities and well, decreasing health disparities and increasing health equity. The patient navigation initiative is divided into two components. The first includes individual grants to 20 healthcare systems across the United States and Puerto Rico awarded in 2022 post a competitive application process. Each grant supports an established navigation program with the goal to enhance said programs and advance barriers and challenges impacting patient recipient of high quality cancer care. Rush University Medical Center and the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center are both grantee sites. The second program component is a webinar series designed to share expert content on relevant topics in patient navigation. The overarching theme of our webinar series is advancing equity through patient navigation. This webinar series focuses on the importance of SDOH screening, processes for developing workflows, tracking tools and documentation, and the practice of navigating patients to address barriers to care. This is session two of three. Social determinants of health can pose barriers to individualized, timely, and equitable access to cancer care, especially for socially disadvantaged patients. Oncology patient navigation can help overcome health system and patient barriers and facilitate timely access to health care. On behalf of the American Cancer Society, I am proud to present today's session. Thank you for joining us to hear from our awesome presenters from Rush University Medical Center and the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center. These speakers were invited today to share their center's process. Each site will present for, more, for no more than 20 minutes and we will have time for questions and discussions after presentations are complete. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Our work would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Sponsorship for this initiative was led by AstraZeneca and the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, along with Bristol Myers Squibb. Additional sponsors include GlaxoSmithKline, Genentech, Daiichi Sanko, Novacure, Pfizer, Santa Fe, and other funders. I also wanted to do a quick review of Zoom policies. Today's uh, session will be recorded. You'll be getting a copy of the recording after uh, later this week. You'll all be muted and we can only allow um, you to ask some questions in the Q&A box, but we welcome your questions there and look forward to answering them at the end. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Bonnie Ewald is from Rush University Medical Center and uses she, her pronouns. Bonnie is a dedicated public service professional working at the intersection of healthcare and social service delivery, health policy, research, and education to improve our problematic healthcare system and ultimately improve health and quality of life for marginalized communities in particular. In her work as a manager in the social work and community health department at Rush University Medical Center, Bonnie collaborates with clinical leaders to develop, evaluate, and sustain initiatives provided by social workers, community health workers, and AmeriCorps members that improve quality of care and life. Bonnie also serves as the managing director of the Center for Health and Social Care Integration, a training and policy center based at Rush that works in collaboration with local and national partners. Through her work at the Center for Health and Social Care Integration, Bonnie develops and implements education and training initiatives to spread best practices in care management and social care, advocates for workforce investments, and promotes policy changes to prevent and address health-related social needs. Via the Center's Coalition for Social Work and Health, 
Bonnie also manages a national advocacy and communications campaign for social work's value in improving the nation's health. Bonnie's work at Rush also includes policy initiatives via Rush's Center for Excellence in Aging, including coordinate the bi-monthly American Society on Aging Chicago Land Roundtable. In addition to her management roles and serving as a member of several communities, Bonnie's role also includes academic work. She serves as an assistant professor for social work in Rush's um, College of Health Sciences, is an adjunct faculty member in the Health Systems Management Department, and teaches a graduate course in aging policy for the University of Wisconsin Whitewater Department of Social Work. Um, Bonnie, I'm delighted that you're here with us today, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to share with us. I Thank present you. Bonnie. Thank you so much, Heather. I should have shared a shorter bio with you. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. But thank you all. It's wonderful to be with our colleagues from the University of Kentucky, the team from the American Cancer Society, and so many of you today. I'm Bonnie Ewald. Um, as Heather introduced me, I'm lucky to be part of a broad team at Rush University Medical Center. Uh, you can see some of my uh, wonderful teammates here, including community health workers, uh, social workers, and other leaders in our cancer center, but also across Across our system. So a little bit about Rush. We are a, a hospital. Uh, we are an ur urban medical, excuse me, urban academic health system on the near west side of Chicago, but we are part of a broader system and the Rush health system spans Chicago as well as the western suburbs. Through our system, we are very um, proud to have a cancer center provided at our main campus, as well as out in Aurora at our Copley Cancer Center, as well as uh, expanding access to care through additional uh, sites to uh, meet people closer to where they are at. As an institution, Rush is also recognized broadly as a leader in health equity work, social work, aging, and caregiving. We have a number of different social care initiatives happening across the institution, including a team of uh, centralized community health workers, CHWs, as I'll be talking about uh, today. And I, again, as I have the privilege of working with, um, I'm going to uh, pop up a, a graphic on the screen here so you can get a sense of some of the range of social care activities that we have in play at Rush. Folks might have seen this framework before. This is from the National Academy of Sciences of Engineering and Medicine um, study that came out in 2019 on integrating social care. And they describe that social care activities from, from healthcare delivery systems really should span these five A's, raising awareness about patient social needs or communities' needs. Um, in At Rush, for instance, we are screening for social needs across different care settings. I'll be talking about that today in the Cancer Center. Um, also, that team should be looking at how they can adjust how they provide care to uh, increase access uh, despite uh, social needs that individuals might be experiencing. So getting out into the community, we have an at-home primary care clinic, for instance, out in the shelters, a lot of screening, but also care itself. Um, providing assistance itself. Um, my team is coming back in two weeks for the next uh, series in this webinar to talk about kind of the practice itself, how we build relationships, et cetera, uh, and how we go about trying to provide assistance to address people's concerns and maximize uh, those moments uh, with people. Uh, and then there's also community level work that's really important for institutions, including cancer centers, to be thinking about how are we aligning with community partners and Rush at Rush. There's a few examples uh, that we have underway that I've listed here. And how are we advocating to ensure everyone can get access to this kind of care? When we did uh, just this morning, we were having a conversation about um, undocumented folks who do get Medicaid-like coverage in Illinois, but there's co-pays co associated with any cancer treatment. So you can imagine what that does in terms of access to care, especially with so many co-pays. So advocacy needed. But in terms of this specific work, I'm happy to get a chance to um, share how we are building on kind of the longstanding work and leadership of our supportive oncology team in the Cancer Center, which includes our distress response social workers, social work care managers, our patient navigators and nurse navigators. I do want to highlight we've, we're lucky to have 
uh, patient navigators on our team. Originally, uh, we had American Cancer Society, a navigator embedded within Rush. And then when that transitioned a few years ago, our supportive oncology team was able to advocate to leadership to actually get institutional funds to support a patient navigator, specifically focused on uh, transportation supports and appointment supports, some of the biggest pain points for the supportive oncology team. And so that was one great success story of in the past, how we were able to build on um, this initial demonstration of kind of having these promising roles available. And we look forward to continuing to build on that. Uh, broadly, as Rush as the system is rolling out social determinants of health screening, the Cancer Center uh, has also been uh, doing that as well. And we're lucky, as Heather described, we're lucky to be one of the grantees under this navigation initiative. And so to get um, some funding for two community health workers to be embedded um, as folks who can provide this personalized social care. Um, I do want to just highlight, I know institutions use a lot of different screenings. Um, as folks might be aware, there are increasing kind of requirements in terms of reporting uh, from institutions on the hospital side, but also on the outpatient side, um, just in terms of general uh, from Medicare, uh, not just focused on cancer. And uh, we are using a screening tool that's built out of EPIC's kind of centralized one, which is curated from different validated questions. But we hit on CMS's core required domains, um, which includes interpersonal violence. Uh, utilities is a new core required domain they're adding. Um, but also employment is another piece that we as an institution broadly are asking about. I'll come back to that and how that's been a little bit of an implementation challenge with our, our screening. We are also really lucky to have the ability to leverage some of the grant funds to also support some basic resource needs for the for the individuals we're supporting. Okay, so our community health workers, as part of this broader supportive oncology team, are engaging at different points. And the infusion units, we are conducting our initial, or excuse me, the initial social need screens and then providing follow up interventions. You can see details on the screen of kind of logistically how that works in terms of identifying new patients. Um, as much as possible, especially um, when people are at extended visits, we try to, you know, provide the emotional support, the information on resources, et cetera, in the moment. Um, but we do, we will meet people at follow-up visits or do follow-up call if needed. Um, in radiation oncology, um, as another one of our initial focus areas, uh, the Initially, the nurse navigators were active in conducting the screenings and then uh, referring to us. And now we have a workflow where patients are either completing the screening ahead of time through, we use Epic, so through their MyChart account, or if they um, do not complete it ahead of time, aren't active on MyChart, uh, we get them set up in person and completed on an iPad. And then a team member, the nurse or MA, refers to the community health worker in Epic using our Epic order. And then we have the work queue to manage it. Our team is also following up to rescreen and provide additional supports to folks every six months, knowing that needs change. Sometimes they change more often than that, of course, but that that's kind of our, um, our check-in point. Um, and I do just want to mention we're lucky to have additional community-focused work uh, and uh, our community health workers are able to support some broader work with additional funding by the Coleman Foundation. So in our interventions themselves, our community health workers are focusing on building rapport, leveraging shared cultural lived experiences. We really prioritize, and the, I should have included or named this definition explicitly, but it's really important um, when bringing on and building teams with community health workers, maybe are serving in navigation roles, but kind of the, um, the value is that people have trusted and deep relationships with the communities that they're serving. Um, oftentimes actually living in the communities themselves, having close family or loved ones. Um, the CHWs 
the primary focus of their work is helping folks navigate uh, different community resources. We do use a uh, social health assistance refer referral platform. Uh, we use Unite Us, um, originally now POW in the Chicago area. And so we we will tailor and then, you know, push, create and push out either via email or text or print out um, curated resource list. We'll talk with people about the process, what it looks like to access those resources, et cetera. We'll also, um, in our interventions, are uh, making a point to identify family caregivers and uh, refer to Russia, the Caring for Caregivers program. Um, that, as a side note, we also provide trainings for through an initiative with the John A. Hartford Foundation. So if anyone is interested in having a more robust support for your uh, caregivers of the folks you serve, we would be happy to chat. Our CHWs are also lucky to um, have as part of their role, as I mentioned, uh, we have some grant resources to provide uh, basic resources for people, and one of those is food delivery boxes. So we have um, three months of food delivery boxes if folks report being hungry, and um, our CHWs can get um, folks set up with uh, delivery boxes, and then they're actually doing the additional follow-up calls to help coordinate that delivery um, of course, referring to different health promotion, socialization programs, our, our team, um, our collective team runs Cancer Thriving and Surri Surviving as uh, one example of an evidence-based program. Um, and then, of course, we have a um, the robust integration with the broader supportive oncology team and a really close attention to escalation and referral needs with oncology, uh, the social workers in particular. The CHW follow-up happens, like I mentioned, typically during that initial interaction, but sometimes at a follow-up appointment, our telephonic protocol is to do two, three phone uh, outreach attempts um, before we uh, kind of close an outreach. We will always document in the chart to make providers aware if we aren't able to get in touch with someone, we'll try to monitor for upcoming appointments, but um, just naming that that's our protocol. Just to get a sense of the reach that the team has had in the last calendar year, we had a little over 1,300 encounters, um, an average of about 25 minutes per encounter. Most of these interventions are provided in one contact, um, and I'll come back to this as something we love to keep studying and understanding um, kind of how to maximize the benefit and maximize reach. We, to describe this work and capture it in a way that uh, is helpful for providers, um, but also for our team broadly in terms of quality improvement, um, we have our team document in three different places. So I just wanted to highlight first is the kind of centralized social determinant of health screening. As I mentioned, this is Russia's centralized a uh, screening tool, it's a flow sheet in Epic, shows up the same way, then it's it works out really well if a certain need is identified, an icon corresponding to that need will kind of show up in the provider's dashboard. Um, and really the, the value of this sort of interface in terms of documentation is to raise provider awareness. We also know um, that increasingly there's a movement to identify social needs similarly to how physical health conditions might be identified. And this is through a family of ICD diagnostic codes called Z codes. So folks might have heard um, and be familiar that increasingly institutions are capturing the Z diagnostic codes that might relate to someone's specific report of experiencing homelessness, for instance. And then in that healthcare um, exchange, that diagnostic code can be used um, and connected to the claim. So there's various um, kind of alignment um, benefits for us. Um, and so I will just name that capturing this information in a universal way is um, part of what enables those coding teams to more centrally capture Z codes. Our team is off also uh, documenting, and a lot of our work is documented narratively in progress notes, uh, really, again, to raise provider awareness at the more detailed level and communicate details with other providers on the team in case, um, let's say I'm a social worker or a community health worker, if I get sick, I want my colleague at need to be able to jump in um, and actually, you know, follow up if needed uh, based on what a note might have been. Um, 
we you can see a screenshot on the right hand of the screen of some of the pre-made um, like dot phrases that we have for the team to fill in and then they can um, edit and personalize uh, just to save themselves a little bit of time. And then we also uh, track data in what we call our post encounter form. And this is a custom built flow sheet for our core social care teams. Um, this we track um, time spent in each contact, the number of contacts across an overall encounter with someone, a drop down of the social care interventions that we're providing, data on what team we're on, the purpose of call, um, that kind of information. And we do have corresponding dashboards that we can use to monitor. We do also, while we try to keep work in Epic as much as possible, uh, we do occasionally um, need to use Epic or it's just simpler to use, or excuse me, to use Excel uh, to track some of our outreach. So here's a screenshot of an example from our six month rescreening. Um, rather than having a custom report and kind of work queue built up in Epic, um, we kind of organize that work uh, in Excel. And so taking a step back, some of the ways that we use this data uh, is to first um, get a sense of screening rates, overall outcomes, what are the most common reported needs, where might where are we seeing maybe screeners aren't being completed or only certain questions being completed. Um, we've used the screening response data to help us identify that we should prioritize food and transportation um, in terms of the resource um, funds that we are lucky to have access to. We also look at individual metrics um, and you can see some of those here. And then on the support side, we have a lot of built-in um, attention knowing how demanding and complex this work is. And um, so we build in case support discussions, vicarious trauma mm -hmm. sessions, um, touching on grief and loss around working with, with families going through grief and loss as well. So looking ahead, just a few comments on what's on our radar. We are interested in really understanding kind of the patient experience of this model. As I mentioned, we've had this robust supportive oncology team working, but having someone with intentionally with this um, cultural and lived uh, experience shared with a, pre a predominant community that we serve. Um, that hasn't necessarily been done before with a dedicated time at the bedside in some cases or dedicated time to intervene with a focus on social care. And we want to um, try to study what is the value of that uh, social care assistance, relatively light touch, as you saw, many of those touches were, or many of the encounters are just one touch point. And if, um, if we identify that that is largely addressing the need, because we have these other existing supportive oncology supports in place, that's great, because then our team can reach more people. Um, but maybe we'll learn that in some cases, uh, it would be beneficial to uh, work a little more with people. So we want to study that a little bit more. And as part of that, we're looking to transition some community advisory um, board discussions of sorts that we've been, not advisory board, but advisory council um, discussions that we've been having, transitioning those to some of the actual service re recipients that we've worked with to get some of their input. Uh, we largely are working on some different uh, workflow and partnerships uh, related to screening, optimization. Um, of course, there's a lot of similarities with the themes in uh, distress screening. And so uh, we have aligned with escalation protocol, et cetera, but just looking for additional alignment opportunities. Um, the there's one question in particular as we're using the rush wide screening tool, the employment question is uh, not worded in an effective way really for any care setting, but especially not for cancer care because it's just simply asking, are you unemployed? And we know that um, really the question should be more so like, are you, are you concerned or looking for work, et cetera. Um, and so we're working on some of those adjustments uh, looking to collaborate with different teams, including our breast cancer service line that's uh, working on a study to have more proactive outreach um, that we're really excited about. They've seen really promising results from having social workers involved and want to extend that reach by also including community health workers on the team, doing some epic revisions to be able to more easily get more data from our documentation. And last, but definitely, definitely not least, we are working actively on aligning with 
new uh, revenue opportunities that are coming uh, that are here because it's January already um, from Medicare Part B uh, that really is directly um, prompted to make available to keep supporting work like having community health workers and patient care navigators available on uh, care teams. Uh, so with that, I will look forward to transitioning over to the next team and to the broader discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. We have some questions that we'll save for the end so that you have uh, a chance to answer them. But there was a lot of uh, a few questions, right, that came up that some that we could have anticipated, but we'll ask them at the end. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce our second panel. Next, we will hear from the Markey Cancer Center. They're going to share a little bit about their screening approach. And today we're honored to have uh, Pamela Hull and uh, Dr. Tim Mullet. I'm going to introduce Pamela first, but Timothy, uh, excuse me, but Dr. Mullet is going to be our first speaker. So Pamela Hall is a PhD. She has a, her, she also, I'm sorry, here I go. I'm going to start again. Pamela Hall has her PhD and also works as an associate professor of behavioral science at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. Pam is a medical sociologist with 19 years of experience in conducting community engaged research with a focus on reducing health disparities and collaboration with community partners. Her research focuses on the implementation of evidence-based practices for cancer prevention and quality cancer care, specifically focused on HPV vaccination, social needs navigation, technology-based applications, and implementation science. Dr. Hull serves as Associate Director of Population Science and Community Impact for the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center, where she leads Markey's community outreach and engagement efforts through the Community Impact Office. Timothy William Mullet, MD, MDA, FACSH, is a professor of surgery in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University of Kentucky. He received his medical degree and surgical training at the University of Florida and has served on faculty at the University of Kentucky for the last 25 years. Although he has experience in cardiac surgery and transplantation, Dr. Mullet's clinical practice and research focuses on the overwhelming burden of lung cancer in Kentucky. He is a member of the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center, Kentucky's only National Cancer Institute designated cancer center and is the chair of the University of Kentucky's Cancer Committee. This Commission on Cancer program achieved an outstanding achievement award in 2017 Dr. Mullet serves as COC State Chair for six, served as COC State Chair for six years and was awarded Outstanding State Chair in 2019. In October of 2020, Dr. Mullet was installed as Chair of the Commission on Cancer. Currently, Dr. Mullet is the Medical Director of the Markey Cancer Center Affiliate Network, a program that provides high quality cancer care closer at home at collaborating centers through specialty services, education and outreach programs. He also serves as medical director of the Markey Cancer Center Research Network, a collaborative network of sites that, conduct a, that conducts a portfolio of high priority trials, including therapeutic oncology trials and interventional and non-interventional studies appropriate for community centers. No matter how many times I practice, I still get tongue tied but I am delighted to have our two expert speakers here today. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Mullet. Thank you so much. Heather, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here and uh, apologize that we didn't uh, truncate that for you. Um, <clears throat> but again, I'm, uh, I'm privileged to talk with you today uh, about our uh, work here in uh, Markey Cancer Center, trying to address the social drivers of health uh, increase our effectiveness with screening in this area and addressing barriers to care. And as we, uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to see a collaboration between different grants that we have. Uh, and uh, we are certainly grateful to the American Cancer Society uh, for, uh, uh, for funding this project that we're going to talk about today. 
Uh, again, Dr. Hall and I are presenting, but we really represent a very large team uh, that is uh, working together to uh, try and improve uh, the effectiveness of uh, documenting and addressing social drivers of health and uh, engaging with our very talented uh, psych oncology team uh, led by Joan Scales uh, and uh, being able to see how we can uh, deliver uh, more effective care in this challenging time. So our project is, uh, is really one that is uh, driven by our psych oncology services. This team of experts and professionals is absolutely outstanding with regard to uh, addressing the needs of our uh, of our patient population uh, and our broader population in uh, in the catchment area that we serve. Um, uh, our attempt here is to be able to meet mental health and social health needs through navigation uh, with patient centered care, uh, and it's really an adjunct to the excellent care that's delivered in the clinical setting. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, there are. Uh, there are barriers here that we need to be able to work. And even though this team is growing, uh, uh, we have uh, needs that need to be addressed. We have an increasing volume, a relatively high volume of patients um, uh, at Markey Cancer Center. And the level of psychosocial distress is uh, out of proportion to what we see in the other areas of the country. And so it's important for us to be able to address these. Uh, but we do have a limited staff capacity uh, to address these. And uh, as has been mentioned in uh, uh, Bonnie's presentation, you know, there's a there's a, a increasing, but still a lack of tools that are present in the EHR for uh, for being able to track and report the metrics that are necessary. And so, those again are increasing, uh, but uh, we really need to be able to accelerate the pace of being able to track these. So the long term goal of what we are. Uh, linking with, which is called the Comprehensive Connected Cancer Care Program, or the C4 program. This is a, uh, a grant which is funded by the Merck Foundation um, and uh, is uh, able to dovetail with our work with the grant from the American Cancer Society to be able to advance health equity by removing social drivers of health barriers um, to uh, timely cancer care. And so the purpose of this project is to enhance the capacity of our psych oncology office, not just by adding personnel, but by adding, by being able to address these SDOH needs uh, through better, better patient navigation. Uh, our objectives are to add non-clinical patient navigation uh, to the complement of existing uh, social workers, and then expand the reach and impact using innovative digital tools to be able to uh, reach patients when they have needs, not just when they are in front of us in our clinic, uh, and also use quality improvement tools to increase the impact and develop sustainability of these models. Obviously, I have a strong interest in how we connect with the Commission on Cancer, and I feel that our standard 5.2 uh, in psychosocial distress screening, which really began back in uh, was implemented in 2015 in one form or another, um, and then uh, addressing barriers to care uh, has been added uh, as a modification of our navigation standard. Um, and so these are in place to be able to identify uh, these psychological, social, financial, and behavioral issues that may interfere with the patient's treatment plan and adversely affect treatment outcomes. Uh, and so the process uh, also needs to provide patients identified with distress the appropriate resources and or referral for psychosocial needs. Now, because this standard has to address all 1,500 cancer programs across the Commission on Cancer, we can't be very specific in this, but we recognize that the intent is to uh, is really being re is really being uh, validated by this very grant. Uh, and then standard 8.1 barriers to care uh, is to identify uh, either patient system or provider-based barrier uh, to accessing health uh, or psycho psychosocial care. Uh, and so, again, we feel that this, uh, both grants that we've discussed are uh, addressing these standards. And so we find that programs participating in this are going to have value in this. Our real intent here is to be able to see how we can right-size our navigation uh, for the needs that the patients have. 
And if we broke this down into the types of navigation, and by the way, I appreciate that there are already questions that are popping up in the Q&A box. Please add your questions in that space. We really want to have time to address your specific interests, but thank you to those that have put some questions in. Um, we recognize that navigation comes in several different forms. We have uh, a nurse navigator, a registered nurse with oncology specific clinical knowledge. And then they have some uh, understanding of mental health needs and some understanding of the social health needs that are available. They may not have a ready knowledge of exactly what resources are available or the time available when they are appropriately focusing on physical health needs and clinical care. The social work navigator uh, is uh, often present, uh, usually has a master's degree in social work and a clinical license. And uh, obviously their focus is on addressing mental health needs and understanding the social health needs that are present for the patients. But again, how do we put them in the right space to optimize their practice um, and, uh, and to not drift over into what may be in the clinical care um, and understanding that in our institution, we may have dedicated social workers within our cancer program. Many institutions have social services that are available uh, for the entire institution and they may be more generic. So being able to drive this into direct cancer care is an important feature. The addition of a non-clinical patient navigator or community health worker doesn't necessarily have training in the clinical space or in the mental health needs, uh, but can be very effective at understanding and addressing the social health needs. And so right-sizing where these navigation elements come into play uh, is a key element for us. And this is a challenge that we had to, uh, had to overcome. We have to really coordinate this workflow and the processes that exist across the various navigation roles and the patient contact points to maximize efficiency and cost effectiveness. So we don't have uh, team members that are uh, not operating at the top of their license. It's a wonderful privilege for us to work with, uh, with our new patient navigator supported by this grant, uh, Charles McCann. Charles came to us in the cancer program from financial uh, assistance. And has, so he was very comfortable with talking to patients about their uh, financial toxicity related to their medical care uh, and has a real heart for this uh, activity to be able to understand and to drive into where uh, these social drivers of health are interfering with the patient's care. And so having this at that uh, uh, patient navigation level as, again, uh, looking at where we are in this non-clinical patient navigator has been a real adjunct to be able to allow our social work services to be able to work in the, in the space where they can be more beneficial uh, and working in open communication with the, uh, with the clinical navigators as well. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Hall and let her uh, take us through some of the uh, details of how we've evaluated and are addressing some of these uh, barriers. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mullet. And just wanted to say that Joan Scales, our Director of Psych Oncology, and Charles McCann, our patient navigator, are on the call today and are going to be available during Q&A as well to help share their expertise and, and perspectives from their different roles. Um, I'm sure some of our social work team is also able to join, hopefully. Um, but we're really grateful for the, the hard work they do every day with our patients. So we've been working really closely with this team and kind of breaking out, you know, doing some workflow analysis of each of the stages of the process. And so it kind of broke it down into three pieces to show today. One is the timing of screening. When do we screen patients and how do we determine that? So the current process at Markey is to do psych, uh, social terms of health, psychosocial distress screening at the initial visit. And then also every 45 days after that, depending on when they come back, it has to be at least 45 days um, from the last time they were screened. And so there is a, the EHR is set up to sort of flag that, yes, they're due for a screening or no, they're not due for a screening yet. Um, the, some of the gaps that we have in that process that we wanna try to address with the digital tools that we're gonna be adding in are, um, it's currently we're only screening patients when they come in person to the clinic. And that, you know, that, their, their needs might change the next day. They might change a week later. So we're, we're hoping that these tools that we're adding can help the patients um, reassess and report some of their needs that, that come up while they're at home. 
um, and experiencing their, their cancer journey. Um, also, sometimes patients get missed even with this process and, and it's very dependent on staff to, to make sure it's implemented. So we're hoping that digital tools can help to complement that and ensure that, that fewer patients get missed. We can go to the next slide, Dr. Muller. Um, and then next we see, okay, once we, uh, once we have flagged a patient is due for screening, how do we implement getting um, social, psychosocial distress, distress screening done? So first, uh, the first route is if they, we have Epic, so if they have my chart and they use it and they have notifications turned on, then they get a signal through my chart, um, the top the top row um, here in the figure uh, to say, you, you know, you can complete this this form, this questionnaire as part of your pre-check-in before your appointment. And um, hopefully they will log in and do it um, and then they'll be done. They go all the way across the top of the figure there. Um, then if we go back to the left side, do they have the H, um, my chart? If it's no, then they get screened when they're in person in the clinic. And we have a little bit different process uh, based on which clinic it is. In um, a couple of the clinics, they the nurse and staff while they're doing their intake interview with the patient will um, administer the questions, ask the questions to the patients and record them in the EHR. And then the other clinics, um, they are given an iPad uh, to complete themselves. And if they don't want to use the iPad, they also have a paper alternative to fill out the, the NCC and distress thermometer form. Um, and then the nursing staff reviews it and enters the information into the EHR. So that is our current process. And also if they had my chart but didn't fill it out, then they go to that in-person process. So some of the, the gaps that we see are still, it's, you know, still patients getting missed. Not everyone gets screened. So we're, you know, want to see additional ways that we can add more tools to catch patients at different, um, different times and have a higher rate of screening. Um, and those, the cases where the, the staff person is asking the questions, that is, is less than ideal. We would prefer that the patient, it's be, can be more patient driven and answer themselves the questions because there could be um, you know, being in a rush and, and want to simplify things, the staff could maybe not ask all the questions and kind of interpret for themselves what they think the the um, information is and mark the answer that may be under-reporting what some of their problems are, the needs that they have. So that's one thing we want to address with the tools. Yes, go ahead. And then say once, um, once someone completes the screening, what do we do with the information? So um, most of you, are I'm sure, are probably familiar with the NCC and distress thermometer. You have a number that is chosen on the left side, um, zero to 10, what is your level of distress today? And then on the right side, you have a checklist of different problems that they can select, uh, psychosocial problems, emotional, health, spiritual uh, problems, pain, and things like that. And also the, the um, practical needs category that is their, more their social determinants uh, needs, their social health needs. But what we do, um, you know, because we only have so many staff to be able to serve all of our patients, we have to have a, a process of, of triage of who do we direct the, you know, prioritize and directing attention to. So what our current process is, is based on that score, um, the overall distress score from zero to 10 that the patient reports, uh, we break them into two groups. So if it's zero, if it's six or lower, um, we do not set up a flag for sort of um, proactive contact with the patient. The patient can still reach out to psych oncology. They can still ask the nurse or the doctor for assistance and, and get to their psych oncology team in other ways, but um, they don't get flagged for follow-up. And then the ones who score seven through 10, um, there's an EHR flag and it gets sent to the psych oncology team um, in their message basket to look at them. And then they further um, triage them as well. The ones that are nine to 10 is a very high level of distress. They, they, go to meet the patient in the room while, while they're in the clinic. If they miss them, they follow up with them on the phone. So very, you know, making sure that's sort of an urgent need that is taken care of right away. Um, and then as they can, the best that they can, then um, secondly, direct their attention to the seven and eight uh, scores. And if possible, meet with them in the room, follow them up as well. But again, just some prioritization that has to be made in terms of time. Um, and then follow up afterwards if, by phone if needed. So some several gaps here that um, you can see the obvious one is we have limited ability to to meet the needs of the, the patients who score themselves a zero to six. And we know that they might, you know, it's subjective. Everyone kind of interprets their distress level differently. They might mark a five, but have several practical needs or social health needs that could be addressed and maybe barriers them coming to their appointment or their treatment. So we really um, think that's a key way that adding the patient navigator role, adding Charles McCann to this team um, has been able to help to start reaching out more proactively to those patients who have a lower distress level and seeing what problems they check and how can we help them. 
Um, and then another way we can do that is through the digital tools, because we think that there can be some sort of self-service um, in our patient app where they can, we can kind of in an automated way. So oh, you check these problems, here are some resources, would you like to use them? So that's, we're gonna talk about more of that in a second. Um, but, and then the sort of the additional on the right side, um, some additional tools, um, digital tools and informatic reporting that we'd like to do to, to address some of the gaps are currently having sort of a manual tracking system. If we talk to a patient and give them a referral, it's just manually tracked. We don't have sort of a, a way to track, are those referrals completed or are the services uh, provided and needs met? And we want to, we'd love to improve that. And then, um, you know, not there's not a process currently of how do we link you know, tracking, we can track process, how many get screened, what needs there are, but how we know how that's affecting their outcomes. Is it is it increasing um, their ability to stay in care and to to reduce their fares in their care? Um, you can go forward to the next slide. So I kind of touch on these as I talk through it, but these are sort of the lessons learned summarized there on in the integrating the patient navigator in the workflow. Um, you can see these that are just kind of just highlights are just like Dr. Muller was saying, those various different roles in the navigation process, really clearly identifying those and who does what, who passes on to the other in different cases, et cetera. And we, we're really focusing a lot of attention on communicating with our clinical and operational leadership about the importance of the psycho-oncology team's role and the patient advocator role and um, demonstrating then the return on investment for investing in these resources. And we're, we're kind of trying to piggyback as we can at the our previous speaker talked about a system-wide implementation of social determinants of health screening uh, through the CMS uh, requirements. We're, we're kind of coordinating with them. We are having a different cancer specific process um, in our case, uh, but we're coordinating with them on how we can kind of synergize efforts um, for resources and reporting and other things as well. Let's go forward. Um, next is a quick highlight on what our, um, the digital tools are. You can go to the next slide. So our conference of connected cancer care, the C4, um, what we've been developing mostly through funding from another project um, and bringing it into this project um, is kind of two key components, a patient uh, app, mobile app, and then a navigated navigation dashboard for the social workers and patient navigators to track and follow those patients and have a better, uh, a more efficient way of tracking them. Um, but basically the, the psychosocial stress screening is completed on the app and then they can do it at um, before the appointment or at the visit, but also at home at any time new needs arise. And, and as those needs arise, it can make some automated referrals, uh, recommendations of resources directly there through the app while they're at home um, and connect them to, to different resources, uh, making formal re referrals when needed, or sometimes it has to go through the social work office to make a formal uh, submit a referral to another agency. So then pinging back the social work team on when they need to um, talk with the patient and process a referral. Um, also getting them connected with the mental health um, support that we have available. So those are the key focuses uh, of the app and the resources in there. And if you click again, we all also have, um, you know, as other needs arise, they're sort of outside that scope, uh, a way to ping, uh, ping that net need and sort of pass them off, hands off, handoffs, kind of warm handoffs to our other supportive care services as well. And when there are needs that the, that the cancer healthcare team, their, their medical team should address and giving them triggers um, and connecting them um, to tell them how to connect with their team on those things. So that's sort of big picture. And then we have a couple of screenshots in the next slide, next slide or two. This is a screenshot of doing the distress thermometer on the left. Um, the, next, the next screenshot, sort of an example of, oh, based on your responses, these are some resources that would be useful. The third one is then you can also go and look at the which referrals you've been uh, been given to you, which ones are recommended, what the status is. And then the last one is then you can also go in and look in the database. Oh, I just want to kind of look, kind of browse the categories here, what else is available. So those are bit from patient feedback of what they're interested in. And the next slide is a screenshot of the next two. You can go on the next one, I think, sort of what the navigator sees on there. And this is a, a draft screen, something we're still working on. This is mock data, not real patients. Um, but that that idea of being able to track the different needs of patients and where their status of their referrals are. We can go on to next slide. I want to make sure we end in time to to, fin to have some discussion. Um, some of the lessons learned from the digital tools, a lot of lessons learned, but some that are kind of key in terms of workflow and process is that uh, the people involved in this experience, patients, caregivers, and the staff, it's really important for them to be um, deeply involved in the co-design process that so we're meeting their needs and what's important to them. Patients and caregivers say, yes, we want this app, uh, but 
we also want to be able to talk to a real person. We do like them coming to see us in the clinic. We do want to be able to call them still. So having both um, uh, is important to them. And, you know, not everybody wants a smartphone or an app to use. Many do, but we know not everyone does. So we also need to have alternative uh, paper methods. And also we need um, ways to get them connected to those resources. Um, if they don't have an internet or a cell phone, getting them connected to those digital resources. Um, and these are some of the priors from the staff. It's really important for them for this information to get integrated into the HR and avoid duplicating on multiple different processes going at the same time. And they would love a way to better, better document those closing of referrals. We are going to test this um, through small tests of change through the quality improvement process. And we go forward. And one last little thing, the last one is our some metrics. Um, how do we, how do we, how we're trying to, we're trying, we're in the process of we have been doing many of these already, but we're also in the process of building these to the way we have to do them manually. So we can do these many of these things manually, but we're trying to set up more um, automated and sort of um, more efficient ways to pull this information and have it set up in reports, um, combining information you see on the far right side, all the different sources of information that we pulled together for these different metrics. And uh, But we really think it's important to track not only the sort of process measures that are at the top of the list on the left, uh, but also then some of the outcomes. Is it improving, which we haven't had the opportunity before this project, are we able to see impact on treatment compliance, diagnosis, the, the length of time between diagnosis to treatment? Are we shortening that time? Um, can we use this as an opportunity to provide clinical trials uh, education? Um, and how we're reaching um, different um, groups of patients with different needs. So that's a snapshot. We're happy to discuss this more as well, but we'll make sure we have time. So I think that's all. We just have one more lessons learned. So. Um, lessons learned on those those data slides. It's, it's a lot of work, a lot of iterative process, um, but I think we can go on to questions now. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, hearing from the three of you, sharing your different experiences and approaches, and um, especially some of the takeaways and, and lessons learned. I'm sure that the people on the call today are at all different points in terms of doing SDOH, SDOH screening and are excited about uh, the potential for some reimbursement if that's incorporated. Um, I know there were lots of questions. We did answer many of them on line. One question in particular, uh, Bonnie, is for you in terms of which tool do you use at Rush to screen and why did you choose that? tool, if you could answer that for us, please. Yeah, I, I tried an answer in the chat. It's not just a clear, simple, simple answer. Like we don't use the prepare screening or the original accountable health community screening um, necessarily. Folks might be familiar with Epic Foundation. That's a version of Epic that provides kind of preset clinical tools. And they have, they pull in from a number of different um, kind of validated screening tools and questions that are out there. And so then our team balancing different kind of internal needs, but now the external reporting requirements, also trying to balance that, yes, there's could be a lot of utility with exploring a lot of these uh, domains, but what makes sense from like for this one intervention point, what makes sense to be doing at scale versus as part of a clinical assessment, um, those decisions have all been part of our internal evolution. So the basic answer is we, I'm happy to share it, although I don't necessarily think the questions themselves are that helpful. We meet, we have questions again, selected through Epic Foundations that are like, we have the two hunger vital signs questions. We have two questions exploring recent housing security, question about utility needs, a question about employment, as I mentioned, um, depending on the care settings, interpersonal violence questions, and I say that because some settings have other team members that are already asking about um, interpersonal violence, and so in some cases it's been carved out. I hope that's helpful um, and happy to share, but I know it's so much depends. I will say, like, going back to 2016 when we started our system-wide trying to figure out what our strategy was for kind of these more universal screenings. We worked with a number of local hospitals and community-based organizations to co-design a screening tool. We had it custom built into Epic and everything. And then a couple of years later, the centralized kind of Epic tool of the foundations 
tool set came out. And so our whole institution transitioned to that and transitioned questions and part of it. So that's part of the evolution as well. Thank you so much. I think that there probably is no one perfect tool. There's a variety of tools. I think as, as both of you talked about, it's an iterative process. You need to be looking at your data. You need to be gathering feedback from the users, from the patients. You need to be looking at the documentation um, and really being thoughtful and mindful. And as the field is emerging, and it's such an exciting time right now in patient navigation, um, really working hard to be responsive to what's happening. Does anyone from the University of Kentucky want to add anything to the tool selection um, conversation? Um, Joan, would you like to talk about our how we, the NCC and the stress thermometer and how we use that to identify areas of care? I mean, she's able to talk. Oh, but she may not be able to talk. One of our our the psych oncology director was, but I guess I can um, say what we said. So, but the, I was just going to put in the chat that the link to the distress thermometer in case people see have uh, seen it. Um, what we use is what we consider our barriers to care is the the practical concerns category, where it has like um, work, school, housing, finances, insurance. It's very simple. It's just a yes, you know, a checkbox. So, um, it's, so there are pros and cons. We know, but. Um, what we wanted to do though was kind of establish a good process with what we have now and as a way to have track those data. And then we want to come back and revisit, can we improve on that tool? Can we um, look at additional ways? We've learned some, some of our previous work of what uh, patient preferences are, not having just a checkbox, but more of a, a um, you know, levels of need and, and different ways. So that's something we think we can explore more once we have that good tracking and metrics in place. And there yeah, are I'll also... just add that uh, one of our areas that we've been looking at is um, is converting this to from a from a binary yes no process to uh, to really more of a Likert scale so that patients can uh, indicate the severity of some of these issues um, and that way we could actually uh, over time see whether barriers are improving or whether things are getting worse and so I but the current system and what patients are used to was not that and so. Uh, this is a great way for us to get started. Uh, and then as we develop that, we used it in another project a couple of years ago. Uh, we can resurrect that and put it into this process as well. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, be mindful of the time. I will answer as many of the questions as we can, maybe um, right in the chat if there are questions that are not addressed, we'll be sure to follow up and get you some answers to those. I think, you know, once again, you pick a topic, you get some dynamic speakers, and it's really hard because it's so exciting. And, um, you know, there's so much to it. I think we could do a whole other session about um, starting, but we do have one more session in our series. I'm very excited. You can join us back in two weeks. We're going to have um, some folks from Rush, some fantastic experts talking about their day to day and how to go from sort of this box checking into meaningful action and some of the lessons that they've learned in the field. Um, so I encourage you to join us back for that. Also, as we continue to develop um, more resources and webinars and meet the needs of, um, of our audience here. We would love for you to take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation that will be coming your way to share some feedback. We'd love to hear what sort of resources you'd like next. Um, and again, I'd like to thank our sponsors um, without which we wouldn't be able to do our work. And as uh, we announced previously, a recording of today's session will be made available. Our presenters have generously uh, said that they we can share the slides as well. There were a few questions that came up that we have some resources that we could help address. So we may include those um, in our send out as well. But I would like to, again, Thank Dr. Mullet, thank Bonnie, thank Pam for your time today. Thank you very much to our behind the scenes staff, Megan and Amelia, we appreciate your wizardry behind the scenes. And I look forward to seeing you in 
um, two weeks. And thank you so much for joining us today. It was a great session.